From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Carl Walden. There's a message here for me to call you. Oh, yes, Mr. Walden. I'm with Eastern Trust Insurance Company. We're trying to locate an insurance beneficiary named Lorraine Broderick. Understand she lived in your apartment building up until 1953. Well, who told you that? A doctor she worked for here, Dr. Pollard. I don't know where she is, Mr. Dollar. I haven't seen her for two years. We're trying to pay off a claim, Mr. Walden. Didn't she leave a forwarding address or give you any idea of where she... No, no, not a thing. You've got a job in your hands, pal. Huh? I don't think that baby wants to be found. Got a couple of minutes? Yes. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Broderick matter. Lorraine Broderick, that is, missing. Expense account continued. Item 6, $14 even, photographs. The photographer who had taken the pictures of the 1948 graduating class at St. Charles High School still carried the proofs in his files. Among them, four poses of Lorraine Broderick. I'd stopped by to get them on my way out to see Carl Walden, apartment house manager. He hadn't changed his mind about anything since our phone conversation. No, sir, she doesn't seem to want anybody to know where she is. She'd have left a forwarding address or something like that. Instead, she pulled out in the middle of the night, bagging baggage, and that's the last we ever saw of her. Just when was this, Mr. Walden? About the middle of December or so, 1953. Yes, it was a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Oh, you want one of these? No, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Can you think of any place she might have gone, Mr. Walden? New York City. Oh, why New York? Well, it's the closest place to go, isn't it, for somebody like her? I'm not so sure I know what she was like. I've had several different versions, Mr. Walden. Say, you talked to that doctor she worked for? Yeah. Boy, I'll bet his version was a pip. How do you mean? Well, she walked out on him. That poor guy was around here several times asking if we'd heard from her, if she'd written us a change of address. He didn't say it, but I think he had it real bad for her. Oh? Oh, yeah. And I didn't tell him about the other guy either. Well, suppose you tell me about the other guy, Mr. Walden. Well, why not? Well? Well, about a week before she left, I saw her in the hall a couple of times with this other guy. Big, gray-haired man, wore Homburgs and things like that. An older man, is that what you mean? Oh, no, not old. Forty-five-ish, maybe. You know, expensive-looking character. Drove a caddy the size of a freight train, New York plates. You buy and sell this place with his pocket money. Happen to know his name? No. He never came around again after she moved out. But they were sure chummy while he was here. At least a couple of times I saw them together. Can't blame them. She was okay. Did she owe you any rent when she left? Nope. Did she give you a notice she was vacating? Nope, just left. A note or anything? A $50 bill on the desk in an envelope addressed to me. That's all. That's it. Well, uh, was she friendly with anybody else in the building? Well, not that I know of. People here keep pretty much themselves. You know, it's a funny thing. What's funny? That old boy with the Hamburg... I wonder why he never came around looking for her. Good question. Expense account item 7, $22, advertisements. I placed ads in the personal columns of every New York paper. Anyone knowing the present whereabouts of Lorraine Broderick, please contact. I spent the rest of the day interviewing the Cadillac dealers in town on the off chance that one of them might have serviced the Cadillac with a New York plate sometime in December of 1953. No one remembered the man Walden had described. I even tried the service records. Impossible to check. The case was stalemated that way for five days. Last Tuesday, things picked up. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hello? Hello, who is this? Uh, Johnny Dollar? Yeah. Can you hear me very well? Uh, Johnny, I'm calling from New York. Hey, who is this? Why, it's Lorraine. Lorraine? Yes. Yes, I saw your advertisement in the papers, Johnny. I wondered what you wanted. Johnny? Why, yes, that's what I always called you, isn't it? You never met me before in your life. Hey, what is this? Why, I... Just a moment. Go ahead, Mr. Dameron. 
Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Just what is your business with Lorraine Broderick? I want to find her to pay off an insurance claim. Now, who uh, are you... I see. And... I'm sorry. I asked my secretary to say she was Lorraine. I've been listening on the extension. I'd like a little more explanation than that, Mr. Uh... Dameron. William Dameron. 424 East 47th Street. I know how all this must sound to you, Mr. Dollar, but I'm not trying to confuse you. Well, I am confused. Do you know Lorraine Broderick? Yes. Then let's take it from there, Mr. Dameron. <laughs> Expense account item 8, $15. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to New York for the purpose of seeing Mr. William Dameron, whoever he might be, and trying to gather further information concerning Lorraine Broderick, wherever she might be. 424 East 47th was a 30-story job that housed, among other things, the Union Brokerage Company. This happened to be located on a ground-level suite. It also happened that Mr. William Dameron was president of SAME. He looked about the way I expected. Of course I knew Lorraine Broderick, Mr. Dollar. I apologize again for that awkward subterfuge on the telephone. You say you represent an insurance company? That's right. May I see your credentials? Well, sure. Here you are. Investigator. Thank you. We're trying to pay off on a policy, Mr. Dameron. A man named John Smith left Lorraine Broderick a small estate of $1,500. I see. Can you tell me where she is right now? I'm afraid I can't. Oh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, please. Oh, thanks. I take it you knew her in Hartford. That's right, I did. She came here to New York with me. Oh, let me assure you, there was nothing improper about it. I met Lorraine when she was working for a dentist there, a doctor, oh, whatever it was. I happened to have had a little dental trouble on a trip there. I found the dentist and I met her. When I suggested she drive to New York with me, I did it with the understanding that we were to be married here. Uh-huh. You, uh, you couldn't have known her very long, Mr. Dameron. A week. No one could have been more surprised than myself at my own conduct. And still more surprised when once we arrived here, Lorraine disappeared. Yeah, that seems to be a habit of hers. Uh, tell me about it, Mr. Dameron. Look, you're talking to me, not the insurance company. Very well. It was Christmas Eve of 1952. Lorraine was staying with my sister Pauline up in Westchester County. I picked her up about six o'clock that evening to go to a party out on Long Island. Between here and Long Island, we stopped for gasoline. I left the car for a moment, and when I came back, Lorraine was gone. And, uh, well, that's it. Did you see her or hear from her after that? No, I didn't. Did she leave a note in the car, a message of some kind? No. I don't quite get this, Mr. Dameron. You were going to be married after you knew her only a week. You brought her here to New York, and a few days later, she just stepped out of your car in a filling station and disappeared. It's quite reasonable from her point of view, I suppose. But not from mine. It doesn't make sense. Did you have a fight, an argument or something? Oh, no. Well, no. What was it? Nothing, nothing. I don't think I would ever have argued with Lorraine. Lovely, gentle, sweet. Yeah, I know. What about her things? What things? Well, her clothes out at your sister's. Didn't she send for them, or what? Oh, no, she only had two small bags. They're still there, as far as I know. Well, what did you do? Did you call the police? No, no, why? Well, I would if a girl I was going to marry disappeared like that. No, I'm afraid a call to the police would have been, well, rather awkward, a man in my position. Let me ask you this. Do you have any idea why she walked away? Yes. Perhaps it's of no practical value to you, though. Any information I can get will be helpful, Mr. Well, all right, then. I think Lorraine was frightened. Of what? Of life, Mr. Dollar. Not people or circumstances, but, but life. Yes. You say that with a lot of conviction. Yes. Lorraine had always been, well, a poor girl. She lived with a rather decrepit uncle for a time after her parents were killed in an accident, an automobile accident, she said. And I think that I... I offered her the happiness and security she had always longed for... But I also think she was not mature enough or adjusted well enough to accept it. <laughs> this is of no value, is it? Well, it might be. Can you tell me if she ever spoke of any ambitions? Maybe maybe she wanted to go on the stage or become a nurse. Something. Lorraine simply wanted to be my wife and live here. I can see you find that difficult to believe when I'm almost old enough to have been her father. That is not the reason Lorraine walked away from the car that night. 
And believe me, Mr. Dallonis, I'm terribly mistaken. She was very much in love with me and wanted to marry me. Have you tried to find her, Mr. Dameron? No. No, I have not. I waited around the filling station that night hoping she'd return, but I didn't report the matter to the police, as I said before. I intended to hire private detectives to locate her, but then I gave that up, too. I'm afraid I don't understand this. If you loved her... Would this make it more understandable? Lorraine was a rational, normal human being when I left her in that car. No one forced her away from it, or me. The man at the filling station said she merely stepped out and disappeared down the street. She left of her own free will, for her own reasons. Hmm. I think I see your point. Thank you. I have hoped that one day she would appear at my door, contact me, come to me. But she hasn't. The most matchless woman I've ever known. <laughs> Is there any way I can help you more concretely? If you could tell me the exact location of that filling station. Yes, I believe I can do that, but why? Last place she was seen alive. Ooh, that word alive. Just a word, Mr. Dameron. Have you spoken to many people who knew her? A few. The dentist she worked for, an apartment house manager, principal in her high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they all told me the truth. The, the what? The truth. You know, how it actually was. What really happened. Oh, I... Uh, Mr. Dameron, I... she would have run out on you in Westchester, taken a cab from your sister's place with her luggage, or she could have come to you and called off the marriage. Mr. Dollar, please. Now, looking at you and talking to you, anyone would be impressed by the fact that you're a reasonable and understanding man. I am. She could have left you a dozen easier ways, Mr. Dameron, but it doesn't stand to reason that she'd step out of a car on Christmas Eve on the way to a party and disappear. With no luggage, with the clothes on her back, and no more. Women don't do things like that. They want an overnight bag, a change of clothes, somewhere to go to. It doesn't make sense. But that's exactly what she did. They don't do it that way unless there's a mighty good reason. A real guilt edge reason, Mr. Dameron. Something that says what's ahead is better than what's being left. How much did she swipe? What? What did she take? How much? Close to $6,500. $6,500. Lovely, sweet, gentle. She took it from the wallet in my overcoat while I was talking to the filling station attendant. I would have given it to her gladly. All of this, everything. But she had to steal it from me. She had to steal it from me like some common little thief. <laughs> There's truly no fool like an old fool. Is there, Mr. Dollar? There'll be another intriguing episode of the Broderick Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, when the trail really gets hot and goes right down on a police blotter. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.